In today's video, we find some shocking discoveries as we do an EICR for this property where we're planning on fitting solar and battery storage in the future. And make sure you watch to the end of the video where you'll see one of the worst socket discoveries I have ever made. Hit a thumbs up, subscribe, and let's get into it. So the first thing I like to do with an EICR is a quick visual inspection everywhere just to get my head around the property. So we've got three boards here. We've got the main board which does all of the main house stuff. We've got a second board which is for the extension which is I think out the back. Then there's a third board in another extension and there's an outbuilding as well with power. So we're going to have a look at that other board. So here is the second uh, extension board which does sockets, heaters, garage and lights. So there's a garage there. So it looks like we're popping out from here, going into the garage. As you can see, it's like a spider's web of cables going out from the main board. A couple of interesting things back at that main head though, so I'll show you those. So one interesting thing here is they have a three phase service head. Although only one phase is in use right now, it's quite interesting because it means that they've got the potential to have a three phase supply here with three-phase distribution board, stuff like that. So as they're planning on some extensions, it's one of the things that customer wanted to ask is, would it be beneficial to upgrade to a three-phase supply? There's also something else interesting down here. Look, there's a little note. What does it say? To the artisans. I am one of the artisans. Are you ready for the night? Oh, oh man, it's stuck. <laughs> That's tragic. <laughs> Wait, hang, stop. On, hang on. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay, that'll do. Oh, so now, M&M's. Oh, that is... Oh my goodness. We've hit the snack jackpot, guys. It's snacks for us and the snacks for the office. <laughs> These, though, that's, that's, that's outrageous. The king of snacks. What, oh, you like bounties? I love bounties. You don't like bounties? Bounties, well, like you're a bounty man as well. Are oh, you a bounty man? The king of chocolate oh, bars. See. Cameraman <laughs> knows. Cameraman Callum knows. Dear customer, thank you. You know us too well. Right. So first thing I like to do is do neat or not neat on the consumer unit. Ruben, what are your guesses? Well, based on the weather today, I would say <laughs> not neat. I'm intrigued how the weather might influence the quality of the wiring inside the consumer unit. But I agree. I reckon. It, I reckon. If I have to rate this consumer unit wiring in advance without looking inside it, I reckon we're going to be at about a 4 out of 10. Because of the weather. Uh, yeah, well, what do you reckon? How would you, how would you rate that? It, I mean, it is on neat. It's not, it's not neat, but I wouldn't say it's It's definitely awful. not neat, but yeah, seen worse. I rang the 4 out of 10 was not a bad shower, actually. This is the shower circuit that apparently this breaker melted. And so that's why it's a Hager breaker instead of a Proteus one because the Proteus one just like got completely fried and the customer smelled smoke and everything. They came in here and um, they actually called Western Power first to try and find out if it was a problem with the main service head but it turned out it was just this breaker had completely like gone crispy. So we're going to do a bit of extra checks on the shower circuit to make sure there's nothing else that we need to worry about there. Maybe check the isolator upstairs. In fact that might be a good place for you to start Ruben with getting the accessories off. Boom. So we've got the cover off this extension board and this is a lot better. You can see it's quite new wiring and it is a lot neater although there are massive holes in the top uh, which I don't generally like to see but yeah it's pretty neat so that's good. Now as we're doing our initial checks here it's always good to do a few fundamental basic checks like the size of the main tails. We've got to note this all down on the report anyway. We've got a main 100 amp fuse here so we'll note that down. Tails here from this main isolator are only 16 mil by the looks of it. They've obviously upgraded the main tails to 25 mil when they put this smart meter in but they've not upgraded the tails from the isolator to the consumer unit. Although it's on a 100 amp main fuse it's only on 16 mil tails. Let me know how you would code that in the comments below and we'll check the code breakers book in a bit and see if you guys are right. So a big part of, of EICRs is visual inspection, just, just checking, taking covers off stuff, checking the wires, checking the connections. So I thought I'll just whip this kitchen socket off and it's like the wires are like guitar strings in the back. I don't know how they 
ever managed to get it wired in. They've left about that much wire to actually connect the thing in. And I'm scared that if I pull that off any further, the whole thing's just gonna break. Ooh, and there's a, there's a connector block in the back. For some reason, there's a weird connector block in the back of there. So um, we might need to investigate that. Is that a Savoir? Is it, is it a S A V O I E? Yeah. Yeah. What is it, France? Huh? France, yeah. What's that? Just turned into no. Jordan's turned into a croissant. Is actually where uh, my father in law was born, Haute Savoie. It's basically in the mountains. Meribel is one of the ski resorts there. I've actually been to Meribel in, in the summer, been walking in the mountains. They're really, really nice. And we rented bikes and we literally rode all the way down from the top, all the way down to the bottom of the mountain, which is really cool. But yeah, Meribel, beautiful. Savoie. So one of the first tests that we need to do is what's called ZE, it's the external earth fault loop impedance. And in order to do that, we've got to disconnect all of the bonding conductors. Now the easiest way I find to do that is literally just to disconnect the main earth. So that's here, this is the main earth. What we'll have to do before we disconnect that is, what do you think, Ruben? Isolate. Yeah, why should we turn off everything before we disconnect the main earth? Because otherwise if there was a fault, it wouldn't go back. Yeah, he knows. So we'll turn that off, we'll turn this off, and then we'll pull, pull the main earth out, like so. And then we do our external earth fault loop impedance. This is a, a chance to get out the, oh, no. the saucy new Unilight. So this is the new IL425R, absolute beast of a, a work light, saucy 25% discount using our special code in the description. So we connect to our main earth here, and then we're just gonna go on the, the line conductor as it comes into the board. Yeah, okay, so we've got 0.16 for ZE Lee, and now we can do P, P E F C at 1.43 and then we need to do PSC which is prospective short circuit current and we do that between line and neutral. So we've got 1.51 for our PSC. We'll flick all of these breakers off um, and then we'll just do our RCD test. Okay so RCD1 59.9 is our highest reading. 19 milliamps, that's interesting. So that's a little bit low. What is the tolerance on an RCD? What would be a fail? Is 19 a fail? Let us know in the comments, guys. So we've got 28.9 on that main RCD. That's great. That's exactly what we're looking for. I've just been to use the uh, facilities and something brilliant in here. You've got to see this. My lady. This toilet has been twinned with a latrine in Uganda. So, um, toilettwinning.org. Never heard of that before. That is genius. For 60 quid, you can sponsor a, a latrine in Uganda and um, enable people to have a comfortable place to sit on with their smartphone. <laughs> That's cool, I've never seen that before. Toilettwinning.org. Today's video sponsor. Well, that's a nice segue to our real video sponsor, Tado. At this time of the year, customers phone us asking for smart thermostat installs because they're starting to turn their heating on as the weather gets cooler. If you'd like to offer your customers a fantastic smart thermostat, Tado is a great solution. And for professional installers, they have a professional installer portal where you can gain all the training and resources that you need to become an approved Tado installer. Head to the link below where you can find out more and thanks to Tado for sponsoring this part of the video. How do you know whether you need to bond the oil pipe or not? Ask John. <laughs> <laughs> Was it 22,000 ohms? Yeah, so it's the, the, the thing of whether um, something counts in it as an extraneous conductive part or not is whether the resistance down to true earth is below a certain level. And the only way for us to know that is basically to test from our main earthing conductor to the item. And if the resistance is less than 
um, a certain number, which we can quickly Google now, then, <laughs> then you know that it's an extraneous conductive part and you need to bond it. Extraneous conductive part basically means is it bringing earth potential into the building? In other words, like probably that pipe is buried in the ground somewhere. Reading below yeah. 22,000 ohms will mean the metallic item is an extraneous conductive part which does require bonding. Slowly. Yeah, there we go, look. 1.75 kilo ohms. So it is lower than, what were we saying, 22, 22 kilo ohms? ohms yeah. yeah, okay, so it needs to be bonded. Oh. I thought it was a hose pipe. Is that? Is this an arm? Oh my the goodness. Up to the okay. Flipping heck. Look, look all the kinks in it. <laughs> it's like a hose pipe. I honestly would not have thought that it was a cable just because it looks like a, somebody it slung a hose pipe in. Oh my goodness. That is mad. If it works, it works. That is crazy. Look at that. How not to wire up a summer house. Nice, so what are we going to code that then, Lee? Uh, I'll just do it as a C3. C3 for lack of bonding to main conduct main service? Um, I mean, actually it probably should be a C2 if it's going in through the house. Because that's external, isn't it? But it's that one that's going into the house. Yeah, I would definitely be putting it as a C2. Um, uh, it's either it needs bonding or it doesn't <laughs> at the end of the day. Oh! <laughs> getting attacked by bindweed. It's the water running off of it. Right, so off this board here, which is the extension for the kitchen, etc., they've run a ring circuit. A uh, ring circuit is where you've got two wires going out of the circuit breaker and it loops all the way around between all the sockets in a ring and then comes back to the consumer unit, basically. So what we have to check is that there is continuity between both legs of the ring this is what we call the legs so like the in and the out basically make sure there's continuity so it's a loop all the way around and to do that we use our continuity test setting we just go across both sides and what we're looking for is a reading like that so 0.7 is absolutely fine uh, we would hope then that the same would be for the line conductor now why do we say that Ruben well because they're the same size cable and in theory they should be taking the same path the whole way around, so the same length, so then the resistance should be the same. Exactly, yeah. So we've got 0.73 on the lines, and we had 0.7 on the neutrals, so that is acceptable. Now with the CPCs, circuit protective conductors, we would be looking for a slightly higher reading. Why is that, Ruben? Uh, because it's a smaller cable. As the size of the cable goes up or down, the resistance proportionately goes the opposite way. So the, the line and neutral conductors are 2.5 square millimeter square millimeters. The line and neutral conductors are 2.5 square millimeters and the CPCs are 1.5 square millimeters. That means that the resistance of the CPCs should be higher because the conductors are smaller. How much higher we need to calculate. So how would we calculate what the difference should be? If you were to times the line or neutral reading by um, 1.67 because that's the um, like the factor beti between the size of cables you would then get the reading or you should get the right reading for the CPCs. Has anyone got a calculator? Let's calculate what it should be based on a ring continuity reading of 0 0.72 times that by 1.67 what do we get? 1.2 and what have we got? 1.18. So that is almost bang on. So that's exactly what we're looking for. You ready to see some shrunkiness unveiled? Wait, what is that? Actually, what is that? Callum's not an electrician, but I'm sure even Callum would be able to tell that that ain't right. <laughs> Look at that. Oh. <laughs> is it still off of? <laughs> that looks like VIR. That's VIR. Yeah. Better call in the rewire team, mate. Yeah, that is VIR cable there. Those lads are just twisted together. Yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness. <gasps> that is crazy. And then what? You've got the Earth's extended there. Oh, the lives. Yeah, all of it. It extended. looks like they've just they've wrapped that up in tape there. Yeah. You don't have enough room for another connector. So they've just twisted these Earth wires together. Goodness knows where that goes. We'll check if it's live. 
so yeah. it's not live. So guys, let us know in the comments your favourite snack. We've got Maltesers, M&Ms, Snickers, Twix, and for me, the king of chocolate bars, the Bounty. Let us know your favourite in the comments below. Jobless, I don't think Ruben deserves any of these because he overslept. Too late. Oh, <laughs> All jokes aside, I was actually running late this morning, a little bit late. Um, but luckily I do actually have Tradify and I did have to check it this morning. My phone was almost dead, but I was able to just go on my calendar, click on the job where I knew I was working and then literally just navigate and then, well, I'm at the job now. But it's just that simple and it, it's really useful, especially when you wake up late. But if you want to give it a go, uh, you can sign up for 14 days free. There's no credit card details or anything like that. And if you click the link in our description, you can get three months half price, which is pretty solid deal to me. So yeah, check it out. I'm gonna have brown, I think I'm gonna have brown bread. If there is one. Our customers are amazing. Thank Bacon you. sarnies. Okay, I've come out to the extension, which is on the side of the house, just to speed things up a bit. Jordan's still in the main house, doing the um, main consumer unit. So I just thought I'll come out here, I'll test these four circuits, do all the observations in the extension, that can go back on and then it's just one of the boards out of the way which gives us a bit more time to concentrate on the other boards in the house. So what I'm doing now is what we call a figure of eight test where we test the R1 and R2 uh, readings on the ring circuit and to do that we take the two legs, the line and CPC and we link them but the opposite sides. So we take the CPC of one cable, we link it with the line of the other cable and vice versa. And then we do an R1 and R2 test, which is measuring the resistance of the line and the CPC. We do it at every socket and we should have a good reading. Let's have a little look to see if we do. So just a little tip here when you're doing this, you need to plug your green and red into your plus and minus on the mega. That's all you need there. And then just plug in your plug-in tester. Put it on a low resistance ohms reading and we've got 0.49 which is a good reading. So run around all the sockets and check to see if they're all around the same reading. Same, that one's still live as well. So that's good, we're eliminating sockets that are dodgy. So this is on the new ring. Uh, and something interesting, these are all the Crabtree um, fascias so actually it looks like all the new circuits off that extension board they've put the new crabchy socket faces on which means we can quite easily identify which ones are new looks like customers got a very old fashioned lamp of some sorts possibly a DIY jobby that somebody's built it themselves it's just wired up in a bit of bell wire and um, so there's no CPC in that cable at all no earth basically to the fitting it's probably a class 2 fitting so it's not the end of the world Got a very old plug on it with the yeah, insulated pins, which is good, but um, something that you know is just interesting to observe. And it's a classic example of why, like in care homes, for example, they require AFDDs on the socket circuits because a lot of elderly people bring in these lovely old lamps and, and things from their houses, which are contain all sorts of dodginess and can arc, etc. So if you've got AFDDs, you're less likely to cause a fire in those particular cases of dodgy appliances. Okay, so we do have a switch fuse connection unit down there. Wow, it's like a cave of wonders. <gasps> Look at that. <laughs> oh man, the cables in here are just completely slung in. This might even be connected to that mess that Ruben found downstairs actually. Uh, but they've obviously done some alterations when they've put in this new heating system, but they've left the wiring in a complete state. Nice. I mean, you can't even get in because the, the pipes aren't exactly like nice, are they? I feel like the title of Look the video the should just be Shonk. Look at the way the pipes are done, they've just gone, yeah, just what run that hell? one across diagonal. I don't know, that's I that's an interesting one. <laughs> yeah. This is a complete rat's nest 
of cabling and I just don't know where to start here. I've taken the spur off. That First of all, there's a massive pipe in the way of the actual spur, so it's hard to get the cover off. Taking it off and it doesn't correspond at all to the one down there that says water heater. So I don't know if there's another water heater system somewhere else, but the way they've wired up all these pumps and stuff is just a disaster. And all of these cables are just loose here, just flapping around. Um, it looks like they've built this cupboard specifically to house all of this stuff. Maybe they've extended it or something, I'm not quite sure. Probably they just had to build this new door because the existing door was not big enough to fit the tank in. But honestly, it's a bit of a horror show in here. You look down there and there's wires just hanging out that you, you just don't know whether they're alive or not. And there's an old heating programmer down there as well. Don't really know where to start here. It's not making any sense. So we're just trying to test the heating circuit. It's labelled up as uh, they haven't put heaters in yet, but we've got spurs here. So we've linked out line and earth at the board, and we weren't getting any readings on this. Double checked the connections and all that, and still not getting a reading. Sort of thinking, what's going on? But if we go into the next room along, there's a blank plate. There's some absolute shonkiness here. So yeah, they're literally just taped together. I mean, uh, it's nothing, nothing holding them together. It's just ridiculous. This whole place is a mess. But yeah, I'm just gonna bang those in Wagos and then hopefully get a reading on the other side. So this is an absolute car crash in here. Like there's loads of wires just loose. I've not had a chance to check these yet to see if they're live, but I don't think they are because they've twisted the live and CPC together. But what are they doing there? Why didn't someone just take the ends up or something or, or label them to say that they're, they're no longer used? That is worrying for me. Secondly, there's a junction box now in here, just tucked down, very hard to access that I found. I've checked the connections in it and they look okay, but still not great. And then in that spur that I was trying to figure out which circuit it's on, it's actually off the ring circuit, but it's a spur off the ring circuit for the central heating. So nothing to do with the circuit that says water heater at all. And there's also this socket circuit, which is a spur of that junction box down there, which goes up into the loft. I've no idea what they're doing running a socket circuit into the loft, but we might have to get up there and have a little look. I just found this pretty awful to me. And then here I can see that cable that goes up to this the spur basically it comes up to a socket here and then there's a light switch and they've wired some lights some loft lights off of it one of the loft lights is clearly broken so that's not a good sign and the other cables are just sort of slung up everywhere it all looks like a bit of a diy disaster to me this is a classic example of why you should not use these see that it's all melted it's all bloated because it's got overheated because they've basically plugged in too many things into this and these, they just get hot and then they melt eventually and could catch fire. It's got a crack in it as well there, probably just because it's got too hot. So the thing about EICRs is that we're not looking for, you know, little niggly things that don't comply with the regulations or anything. We're really looking for stuff that's not safe or potentially not safe. We're looking to find anything that could cause danger. The actual switch itself looks fine. It's all wired in 6mm. We will check the connections on it to make sure that they're not loose because what does happen in AC connections over time is that they slowly come loose as the sine wave kind of jiggles things around very slightly, you know, very minor vibration. But over 10 years that can cause screw terminals to come loose, which is why anything with a screw terminal should be accessible for maintenance. And the other thing we'll check is to make sure that the shower rating matches the size of the breaker because if they've changed the shower to a higher powered one, that could be what caused the breaker to overload. We can calculate that. 9,000, which is the number of watts, divided by 230, which is the voltage, gives us 39 amps. If that's been installed on a 32 amp breaker, which it is currently, I don't know if the previous one was 32 as well, but probably, then when this shower is running on high, it's gonna be pulling more than the rating of the breaker, and over time that'll cause the breaker to overheat and eventually melt. So really it should be on a 40 amp breaker. So customers just confessed <laughs> that the shower was changed to 
a nine kilo one after they moved into the property and it's one of those things we, ha we see it a lot you know people think oh an electric shower is an electric shower they don't necessarily think about the rating of it so they might rip out a seven and a half kilowatt shower and put a nine kilowatt shower in not realizing that actually the circuit breaker needs to be upgraded in order to do that and actually maybe we need to look at the rating of the cable that supplies it to make sure that it is capable to cope with that nine kilowatt rating because six mil twin and earth depending on how it's been run in it might be quite close to its current current carrying capacity if nine kilowatts is running through it all right so what we found after a lot of fapping around is that it appears that the thing that we thought was a broken ring is actually three radial circuits that have all been bodged into a 32 amp breaker one of them does the immersion heater slash central heating uh, control circuit the boiler is actually fed from a different consumer unit altogether one of them does the front bedroom sockets and then the other one does the study and all of the kitchen sockets basically um, so not ideal the way that it's all been wired up really it could do with the circuit breaker downgrading to a 20 amp at least so that the cables are properly protected but that's quite a lot of loads all off of one 20 amp breaker so i would probably be looking to when we upgrade the consumer unit which i think is probably going to be needed anyway split them into say like three radial circuits instead so that at least you've got three times 20 amps available for those three sets of sockets and just gives you a bit more available power but yeah it was quite a headache figuring all of that out to be honest So we found a few things in the summer house, one of them being that this socket is obviously cracked here and a little burnt out there, something that you can usually see in sockets quite common to be fair. And also the way that they've taken the cables in, there are some bigger gaps in the sides so then spiders are building up cobwebs and just dying in there. So it would probably be worth putting stuffing glands on it and probably replacing the box as a whole. We've also got a spur down there, you can see it from here. That's just a cheeky lid floater um, and it's pulling on the flex going to the heater. So that'll need fixing and maybe even that flex replacing. Overall, it's a bit messy, it's not great, but I mean, the readings have been fine. There's nothing too wrong with it. So one of the things we like to do a visual inspection on is the bus bar and uh, interestingly they've just done a little link of 10mm copper between the main switch and this breaker. Normally you'd have a little bit of copper bus bar there as well but they obviously added that circuit in later and they didn't have any bus bar that would fit. And what I do like to use is this little mirror just to check that the, the teeth of the breakers are in properly. Just make sure everything's lined up properly and it's fully insulated mirror. So that's quite a nice little thing, tool of the day. Little cheeky shout out to Mike from Loadout. Um, he does all these Boddington's insulated tools and they're really, really awesome. So I'll leave you a link below where you can find out more about Loadout and the amazing tool shop that he's got there. This is one of my favorite tests. This is what we call a long wander lead test. And it's literally a really good way to check if you've got earth continuity at every exposed metal work. So switch back boxes, for example, dab that on there. Should got a continuity reading, which we have. It's just a really quick and easy way to test your earth continuity everywhere. So we go around anything that's got metal that should be earth. So metal light fitting, for example. And we're literally just gonna run round, just dab this on all the, the various points. No, this is probably class two. So for metal fittings, usually you would need an earth going to it so that, well, it's pretty obvious metal, if it was to come live, it'd go back down to earth. But here it's w double insulated, so there's no chance of you being able to get a shock through the metal. So it doesn't actually require an earth. So I've checked all the metal light fittings and they're all earthed, which is a nice treat. So our two tests passed. Boom. Now the customers asked us to quote for a load of other work here. The reason we're here doing this EICR is actually just in preparation for the other work. He recently bought the house, so he wanted to get the wiring checked out, but he knows already that he wants a consumer unit upgrade. He wants solar and battery storage in the future and potentially an EV charger. So what we're gonna do is already start planning for the board change. It's gonna need probably a double stack board because we wanna 
combine this consumer unit into that one, make one big consumer unit. We want extra spare ways for solar, battery storage, EV charger, and he's gonna be building a big extension out to the side. So we wanna have probably a big double stack board, but that's gonna mean this meter needs to move down. So rather than just slinging the meter down ourselves, the customer's phoning the meter company now to ask them to do it, but what we'll need to do is just replace these meter tails here with longer ones so that they can move this whole lot down and the meter tails will actually be long enough already to do that. We won't be able to upgrade the consumer unit until the meter tails, uh, the meter has been moved down. So we're gonna just try and do that here while we're here doing the rest of this stuff. And then that means the next time we come back, hopefully we can just do the consumer unit upgrade straight away. So solar install here should be fairly straightforward, except for one thing, there are swifts nesting here. You might remember, I'll leave a video up here, where we had an issue with swifts nesting in a property where you had to get the scaffolding up and down quick enough to get the solar panels on before the swifts came in. Well in this case, we'll probably have to do it the other way and wait until they've flown back to Africa before we get the scaffolding up at this property. It looks like a nice solar install, so we might be back here soon to do that. I'm gonna go back inside before I get blown away. So we've got a bit of an issue with the main bonding because we thought that the water was bonded. However, on closer inspection, this is literally just a link from one side of the meter to the other. So wherever this pipe goes under the ground, it's maybe bonded somewhere else, but we were hoping to come off this for the bonding to the oil just to avoid having to run a brand new bonding cable from the consumer unit all the way around. Because this building's gonna be knocked down in a couple of years anyway and an extension built in place. So it'll all have to be replaced anyway. Um, but that sort of throws a bit of a spanner in the works. So we've got to try and find out where this pipe goes and how we're gonna get a bonding cable to the oil when we change the consumer unit. So we've put everything back together. We've certainly found some interesting things on this one and we'll probably be back here to do some remedial work a big consumer unit upgrade and hopefully solar and battery storage in the future. <laughs> but I hope you've enjoyed today's video. If you did, it really helps if you like and subscribe. And why not settle in and watch a couple more videos? If you click here, you'll see one of the worst DIY electric bodges I have ever seen. And if you click here, you'll watch a video where we installed a ton of solar panels on a tennis court. But either way, thanks for watching and see you on the next one.